Yes. All right, perfect. Hey, hey, hey. hello guys. Um, so today our topic is best practices for implementing Salesforce Data Cloud. Um, as funny as mentioned, I think it's. Uh, I think we are. I think we are good to go. So, yep, here we go. So yeah, before we start, um, I obviously wanted to give a quick reminder that. Salesforce is a publicly traded company and uh, customers sh should base their purchasing decisions on products and services that are currently available. A quick intro about me. Uh, I'm Shubhajit, um, Senior Product Success Architect. Uh, marketing Cloud, Data Cloud and Loyalty Management are some of the major clouds that I'm looking into in for APAC. Um, and then I'm a Product Success SME for Data Cloud in the region as well. 16 years of experience in the industry in Salesforce for over one and a half years. So uh, a quick pick at today's agenda. So we will set the stage by talking about some of the trends we are seeing related to data and personalization and how data cloud can help solve for challenges our customers are seeing. I mean, I know that we already have had a few sessions around data cloud and people are quite aware of what it is, what it offers, but just to set the context, I will spend a few minutes before I get into the best practices. Um, and then we will take us through a typical implementation journey, get key capabilities and considerations around best practices. And finally, probably wrap up with some of the guidances on how do you get started? Uh, you know, the new beginners. And we will have some time for some Q&A as well after the session, towards the end of the session. Does that sound good, funny, and rest of the team? Sounds good, Sophia. thank you. Perfect. All right, so we can all agree, right, with one thing that we are now in a new world and we got tighter budgets, you know, economic headwinds, uh, headcount shortage, supply chain issues and whatnot, right? And we have been asked to do more with less. And that comes with increasing customer expectations. Customer expectations are rising. They want to work with companies who understand who they are and anticipate their needs. And also they want to engage on their terms and conditions and on their schedule. But at the same time, um, I think we can also agree that we are actually more disconnected than ever from our customers. This is because the amount of customer data um, that exists today is expanding at unprecedented speeds. Uh, and that the data often sits in silos and can be very difficult to use <clears throat> for, for meaningful or tangible uh, outcomes. And then there are multiple identifiers associated with each and every customer across various channels, various systems, and various data sources. And then we also have the cookie-less feature on the horizon. Now, what does this mean for the brands? Well, it means prioritizing relationships and connecting with customers in new ways while also finding ways to increase productivity and efficiency and drive more business value with the data and resources that you already have. Now here comes Data Cloud. I mean, that's where Data Cloud comes into the picture, right? <clears throat> I know we have, we, have, we have probably seen some of this information already, as I mentioned, but you know, the top three things that Data Cloud enables us to do is, is, how, uh, is basically power your customer company with unified and real-time data. And how do we do it? We connect data, at scale from multiple sources, various sources. We harmonize that data. We unify that data. And then once the unification is done, uh, and then we can, we can generate insights out of the data. We can learn more about the customers. And then finally, we can create segmentations and activate those into multiple channel systems and, and, and other you know, uh, analytics systems as well. And obviously this is how data cloud works. Uh, again, at a very high level, we are bringing in data sources, obviously data from multiple data sources, like through your MuleSoft, APIs and SDKs, 
But then on top of all that, we have a lot of out of the box connectors and we do have file based storage uh, connectors as well, through which we can bring the data in from multiple sources. Then once we bring them in, uh, we also have options to stream data into data cloud in more real, near real time capacity, harmonize those data, unify those data through data models, and then create multi customer graph, like identity graphs of customers. And then once we have that unification done, we can analyze and predict on the data, create insights, do AI predictions. We also have a lot of lots of uh, you know interesting things that's coming up in the roadmap. Uh, which will help uh, customers to actually build better models with third party uh, you know, sources as well. And then finally activate that data across the, our ecosystem and beyond our ecosystem as well. Now that um, I have said, or kind of we have set the stage, like the context, I will actually take you through some of the implementation best practices for data cloud. <clears throat> now, um, I want to take a step back here. I want to spend some time on this particular slide uh, because I think this is very important. We, I mean, beyond uh, the nitty gritties, beyond the, the, the you know, nuances of data cloud and all that, I think uh, this is, excuse me, I think, is there, is there a question? No, no, I think so. Oh, much. Okay, okay, Sorry. sounds good. So yeah, as I mentioned, like I think this is something I wanted to spend some time on uh, because uh, I think uh, we need to understand how do we get into an implementation? What are the best practices? What are the things that we should keep in mind uh, before we actually jump into an implementation or jump into a build phase or a discovery or whatever that is, right? So I wanted to, I will provide you an overview of what an implementation approach could look like and the different steps those are involved. Now, it is very critical to get the design of the solution right. And based on our experience with initial customer implementations in the past couple of years, we found the approach that can set you up as a customer uh, or as a partner uh, for success right from the start. And the secret sauce here is to carry out the design you know, in the opposite direction, like in not, not, not from one, two, three, four, five, six, rather six, five, four, three, two, one, like in the opposite direction of this implementation flow. If you are familiar with the phrase, uh, like begin with an end in mind, that's where, that's what applies here really nicely. Let me explain what I mean by that. We recommend that you start with identifying the segments and audiences that need to be built for the initial use cases. Now, ideally, this should be aligned to the business needs and considered as the enablers for the next customer experiences to be managed. Now, be mindful of segment cadence and auto-publishing, making sure that you are going to action on that data as each segment publish counts towards utilization. Now, obviously, we have a separate session tomorrow where we will talk slightly about the utilization and the packaging and, and the way uh, the overall you know, pricing and packaging is impacted uh, by the, by, or I would say the, the way the pricing and packaging is redesigned uh, based on the new go-to-market strategy of Salesforce. Uh, but obviously there are more on that tomorrow. But then from segments, we, we derive all the necessary attributes. Now, once you are able to derive the necessary attributes, those are needed to build those segments, you can align those attributes towards your customer 360 data model, which is nothing but the, the data model, the, the standard data model or the extendable standard data model that you have in data cloud. Now, at that, at that point, you can identify any gaps, define custom objects that need to be created to support the use cases, and then also perform audit of the customer data and derive any calculated insights to be created as well. Now, supporting aggregated measures in segmentation criteria is also quite important. So part of this activity is also choosing data sources that are relevant um, for the targeted activation use cases, specifically when it comes to engagement data. For example, standard marketing account bundles, you don't bring it in if the attributes are not used in segmentation as events will be counted towards utilization. Again, we will discuss more about the utilization part tomorrow. And then finally, the profile strategy, right? We talked about the engagements, what about the profiles? So the profile strategy implies 
the knowledge of all data points that need to be consolidated into unified individual. Priority, rules, if multiple sources are reconciled, and also conflicting data. So three things, right, you have to take care. First, the knowledge of all data points that need to be consolidated, the priority and the rules, if there are multiple sources, and also the reconciliation patterns if you have conflicting data. Now remember that unified profiles are another utilization metric that you want to keep an eye on. And then at the end of the day, lastly, you establish the reporting needs, accounting for the ROI monitoring, operational or any tactical metrics, as well as propose any insights that can be used to establish the roadmap beyond the client, you know, the current implementation. And that's obviously because at the end of the day, uh, whatever you, you know, do here, right? You, whatever segments you create, whatever active audiences you create, whatever data you bring in and, and any unification of data that you perform, uh, it's very important that you have some tangible outcome. You are able to measure your ROI. What are you actually getting out of the platform? Because that is what will, you know, uh, keep the customers interested. And actually, um, <clears throat> that will actually something that's that's going to get them excited early about the initial implementation, and then excited again for the next implementation, phase two and phase two and so on and so forth. Their roadmap. Now, as we are talking about um, the use cases, right? What how are we going to work with the customers? How do we devise those use cases? I mean, I think we should spend a little bit of time talking about some of the best practices or some of the recommended use cases, um, use case discovery patterns that we have seen in the past, right? So there are four major pillars when it comes to data cloud, starting with unification and harmonization of data. So what kind of use cases can be there? Like you, like the customer wants to know their customers better. They want to go beyond their marketing data, discover new segments that they are not aware of today. And then moving on to the insights and analytics, uh, how do they improve their customer lifetime value? How do they measure their RFM? How do they segment, create segments which are more precise to their needs, right? So these are those areas like where I, we have seen in the past, right? Customer insights are at a lot of times, uh, this kind of insights on the data is shipped to a third party, like a media or ad partner or something else, right? I think this is where data cloud comes into picture where customer is able to democratize those insights and actually get access, get control of their own data and own insights out of that data as well. Then moving on to the segmentation and activation segment uh, pillar, um, that's, that's basically the area where customers can have use cases around how do they grow their customer engagement? How do they empower one is to one personalization? How do they scale? the way they are reaching out to the customers, right? And then finally, the organizational efficiency where they can there can be use cases around how do, they, how do the customer accelerate their time to market? I mean, uh, there can be use cases such as how do they unify their web data collection? Like they have multiple sources of web sources, like websites, uh, mobile apps, and other things. How do they unify those data collection? So that's, that, that could be an organizational efficiency use case as well. So these are some of the major use cases that uh, you can use uh, kind of as a template while you, while you are going to the customer and having a use case discovery session. Now, um, as we have covered this part, let's dive into the implementation steps, the key capabilities and the considerations and some of the best practices around each and everything, every one of them. <clears throat> um, so before I start here, um, I would, probably give you a minute or two uh, because it's actually, we have a lot to cover here, but um, still, if there is any question at this point, uh, I will, I will uh, invite you for that uh, and I'll take a pause. So I see there is nothing right at this point, funny. No questions at this point, right? No, Sojit. I think we are good. Uh, go ahead. Thank All you. Right, perfect. Yep. Thank you. All right. So let's jump onto the uh, key capabilities and considerations. So starting with, uh, we will talk about what are the implementation steps those are involved in each area, right? So again, um, 
I'm going back to that pattern about obviously starting from data ingestion, model and mapping, unification of data, segment and publish, activate, and of course, uh, you know, gathering the insights out of that data. So in each of these steps, <clears throat> while you are working with the customer, uh, or rather we, we are working towards, uh, you know, uh, the implementation steps involved in each area, uh, what are the major goals of each and every uh, step? Let's discuss that. So to start with, we have data ingestion. <clears throat> So here is where we natively connect to a number of first party data sources, or we also can use uh, ingestion API. We can use a mule soft, like a middleware, uh, any point connect to bring in data, or we could also use the file based connectors such as uh, Amazon S3 or, or Google, Google, Cloud, Google Cloud storage as well. Now, once the data is in, my, my, you know, in, in data cloud, we, all, we, we can leverage the out of the box you know, objects, or in this case, what I mean the out of the box objects, these are the DMOs, the out of the box DMOs or the data model objects that's available within data cloud and the relationships and basically map those uh, objects. I mean, they map the data that's we, that we're bringing in to those out of the box objects. Once we do that, we go to the unification stage. This is where we perform the identity resolution. We leverage pre-built rules. We can create custom matching criteria. We get reconciliation rules. We also can kind of combine multiple and and or statements to ultimately create that unification. Um, you know, and 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 the, based on the unification uh, and the match rules and reconciliation rules, we have our unified profiles with the unified data coming from all different sources. Once we have this, the unification is done. We can build most segments from the unified profile. And then we obviously create our activation target. If we have an activation target uh, requirement, or if we have more of a real time requirement, or maybe something that requires us to, you know, invoke something in a webhook or a marketing cloud, or our, you know, core platform, something in the service cloud or sales cloud, we can invoke the data actions. And then the lastly, we the, the data that we have unified, the data that we have brought into CDP uh, in data cloud, how do we leverage that data uh, for native analytics integrations, or how to what kind of uh, what kind of calculated insights we can create? Is there is there I mean there could be use cases around streaming insights like where you probably want a more real time insights generation, or uh, maybe a real time use case where you can probably stream data in, generate insights out of that, and invoke a webhook or invoke something of a, like let's say a flow based uh, invoke a flow uh, in in Salesforce uh, core clouds. So these are the six key areas of implementation that's involved. And I'm not saying that for every implementation, all six are needed. In some use cases, maybe you don't need an insight generation use case, but in most cases you will probably have. Activation, yes, you will probably have in most use cases. You may not have an activation use case to a marketing cloud or something. If it's a non-marketing use case, maybe you just generate your segments um, and then you access those through an API or maybe you know use a data action or flow based activity to to invoke something on the core clouds so that could be also your use case now moving on um, <clears throat> so this is where we are talking about um, I mean this is where we're actually starting from the from the from the step one which is data ingestion uh, to start with data ingestion um, we need to understand one thing very well very clearly that ingestion and mapping are two separate and two distinct steps. And what do, what do I mean by that? That means different data sources or any anything that you are bringing in uh, to data cloud, let's say a S3 object or a marketing cloud data extension, it could be CRM, um, it could be a commerce cloud or a, or a marketing cloud personalization, whatever be your source, when you are creating a data stream and bringing the data stream uh, into, into data cloud, that's the ingestion part of it. But then after that, it converts to a DLO or a data lake object, which I'll cover slightly more later in the next slide or so. But then uh, once you get that data in the DLOs, you actually are able to map that data to a data cloud standard data model. And you also have the capability to extend that data model with a, with a custom field in the existing data models, or you can create a whole new custom DMO as well, if, if in case none of that standard DMOs uh, fit your purpose. 
and then that's basically the mapping part of it now once the data cloud data streams are managed and mapped to a dmo then you have the resulting data cloud values there are four things which we actually get out of those one we get an identity resolution which is nothing but a unified profile so number two we get insights out of the data through calculated insights and other options we also get segments out of the data which you can publish and then finally we get the activation which is again through the activation targets now obviously i've been talking about uh, the dso's and dlos and we we hear about this a lot right so let's quickly you know just touch up on that a bit as well right so we are talking about data cloud objects and we are talking about dso's dlos and dmos right but then what do they mean how are they different from each other so starting with the dso which is a, which is nothing but a data source object um, <clears throat> which is nothing but a data source object that's that's basically the raw data like the json or csv format of data it could be coming from through a mulesoft or a cloud storage or something like that it's basically data in its raw format so that's your data source object or dso but the once that data comes in that data is transformed and actually stored in the data lake that's there in cdp like in the cdp storage or or the data data cloud storage so sometimes i might be using data cloud and cdp interchangeably so you know it's it's the same thing of course it's a new naming so we are also getting used to that sometimes yeah but again coming back to this the data that is transformed and actually stored in the data cloud the data lake in the data cloud that's the dlo so the data lake objects is where you have a schema enforced model where your transformed data from the dso's are, are are hydrated by transformations and typed as a profile or an engagement data and and basically resides inside there once the data resides inside a dlo you are now able to harmonize that data you can actually harmonize that data and basically map it to a canonical data model uh, through a semantic map mapping from dlo to dmo so that's obviously the data model object something that we use regularly if we are using data cloud um you know uh, one one important thing to note here is that um while you are talking about profile and engagement data we need to basically understand what is a profile data and what is an engagement data and what how do we actually differentiate you know between them so i have a little more on that later i will actually discuss about it but uh, let me just uh, first discuss um, some of the things around uh, you know uh, what are the things that you need to keep in mind as best practices while you before you ingest your data into data cloud because um, you know you can actually bring all your data into data cloud there is a lot of storage there you can use that storage you can bring the data in and all that but you know it doesn't mean that that because you can you should right so you need to understand what kind of data you're going to bring into data cloud and before that you need to build kind of you know investigate the quantity quality and and the accuracy of your data sources before you actually bring it into data cloud one of the things that we suggest and there is a you know image here also like an example <clears throat> so you can kind of build out a data dictionary for every source that is being added to data cloud and it's very important as well because um, because in future right uh, if someone is using the platform um, or if someone is using the product and and basically trying to add something new or trying to make sense of something that is already there in data cloud the data dictionary will help a lot uh, we have seen customers obviously you know data cloud maintains the data lineage it maintains the way the data is coming in and it unifies the data but at the end of the day um, you know as a customer or as a partner whenever you're working on data cloud and you know your data better than anyone right so it's very important that you build out a data dictionary for every source that is being added to data cloud and that starts with the primary keys foreign keys and the nullable fields which is basic the basic stuff followed by estimates of the data quality volumes and some of the data flows followed by um, recognized shared data points like what does this mean let's say you have a customer id that's coming from multiple systems right and you know that you are ultimately going to match on certain maybe match the customer ids to certain conditions right so if you are able to understand and recognize what are the shared data points from where the customer ids or customer identifiers are coming in and then consider possible conditions that will be able to create your match rules at a later stage 
that is really going to help you derive the most value out of your implementation. So before you actually bring your data into data cloud, ingest your data into data cloud, we recommend that you build out a data dictionary for every source and do these exercises. And obviously lastly and more and most importantly, determine the data category for every data stream. Is it a profile data? Is it an engagement data or other data? Now when coming to that, I obviously, um, that is what I was trying to say that I will actually cover a little this in a little more um, depth. Uh, so obviously when you are bringing in the data into data cloud, you have three options, right? You can bring the data in, uh, uh, if, I mean, obviously I know a lot of you are using data cloud already. So you will see there are three options that's available. You have profile data, you have engagement data, or you have other data, right? So what are the best practices? So it's a very simple uh, formula is that any individual or profile-like entity or account, account contact, or any contact point email. So any kind of data that's like that, you just bring it in as a profile data. Any behavioral events or transactional data, which is linked to those profiles or individuals, you bring those data in as an engagement data. And one important factor is that um, engagement data, this category, it needs to include a date field that is immutable. And what does that mean? Meaning it's a transactional data. It is an engagement data or of a transaction or a behavior that, actual, that has actually happened in the past. So that date, the time series oriented combination of the date and the corresponding activity, that should not change. So that's the type of data you're gonna bring in as an engagement data. It could be a order data, it could be visits to a store, or maybe cases created by, an, I mean, cases created for an individual. And then finally, other data, which is, it's kind of something that's related to profile as well as engagement to some extent, but it's not really in that set at all. Like if you have a lookup, like if, if profile data or engagement data has a lookup to a product or a price book or something like that, that's where the other, other category sits in. And one very important factor is that you cannot change the data stream category or the DLO category after creation. So when you're creating a new DLO, like when you are mapping your data for the first time, and if you are selecting that, okay, it's a type of a profile data or it's an engagement data type, you actually, there is no way you can go back and change that category after creation. So the only way you can do, the, do it obviously by deleting the data stream completely and then recreating, that's a different story altogether. And that's why you need to ensure that you understand your data clearly before, before you are bringing your data in and you map your data. Because we have seen a lot of customers who are just, you know, so it's, it's very easy to bring data into CDP through connectors and other things. So just bring it in and just use any of the category and, and apply. And then later on find out that they have actually used the wrong category. So they cannot change that category. They have to delete the data stream and redo it. So it's a very important tip you should keep in mind. Then um, moving on to the data, moving on to the data ingestion related considerations, um, starting with, um, you know, uh, starting with the data quality. So obviously these are some of the things uh, one should keep in mind in terms of best practices, um, because all types of, and like every data source is not perfect. There could be data sources which are incomplete. Um, there could be data sources which are inconsistent. Uh, and that, that's something that you should be very aware of when you're bringing in the data. So you should know what kind of rules will be required to cons for, for the consumption of that kind of data. And then data transformations. So I will um, obviously mention about data transform later as well, I think, uh, but then it's very important to understand when and how the data needs to be cleansed and transformed. I mean, it's, very, it's a very important step. We all know that <clears throat> whenever we are bringing data in from multiple sources, or we are bringing the data in from, um, you know, from a, for a modeling purpose or just mapping the data to a canonical model, whatever be the purpose, right? Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a very important step uh, which is called data cleansing and data transformation. And one simple example is this, right? Uh, you are bringing in a data set which has profile data and engagement data mixed together in one table, right? Let's say you have uh, Fani and Shivajit, we have um, you know, visited some stores and our store visits 
are there in that table with our customer identifier multiple times because obviously we have visited the store 10 times 20 times or you know done some other activities so the profile data uh, uh, my data is kind of duplicated like my customer identifier is duplicated um, and then uh, accordingly my visits to the store is also duplicated right i mean those visits are unique but ultimately the records are duplicated because uh, i have visited multiple times so what do you need to do ideally you need to split that data right you need to split that data into profile like separate unique profiles or customer ids uh, with first name last name or any other thing that you want to store and the rest does and the other part should be the engagements which is basically the behavioral data the visits to the store so uh, so it's very important for you to understand when or where you go you are going to split this data or transform this data before you can actually use this in cdp in data cloud there are other scenarios as well like you are probably bringing in multiple phone numbers for a particular profile you have home phone number and office phone number and something else right and then you probably need to understand that uh, you need to understand how do you uh, map those phone numbers all of those phone numbers to the to the to the data model that's there in data cloud because in data cloud there is only one phone number so you need to create separate columns uh, instead of you know instead of creating separate uh, you know uh, rather instead of creating separate columns you need to have separate rows or records where you can have phone numbers separated out by work phone and and home phone etc so this this row to column transpose this row to column conversion is something that you need to do before you are mapping this data in data cloud so there are multiple other scenarios like very simple scenarios where you may may want to kind of get rid of some null records or some some uh, some other kind of data that's probably not needed you will never map those kind of data and the data is corrupted right so all that kind of cleansing and transformation whether you want to use a formula field or streaming transform or batch data transforms in data cloud obviously uh, in data cloud as part of release 242 which was the most recent one uh, end of february we have uh, we have had uh, streaming transform and batch data transforms go, go, you know live as part of the pro as part of the most recent release so you have the you have a lot of ways now you know, where you can use sql queries to actually transform that data and split the data as needed before you map it into a demo but then beyond that, you should also think about options where you could actually clean and transform some of this data before even you bring it into data cloud. Because remember one thing, and again, we will cover some of that tomorrow. You don't want to bring that some of the data into, into, CD, in, into the CDP or data cloud if you don't need that data, right? If you feel that there is a there are so maybe 30% of my data is junk, just get rid of the data before you are actually bring it into data cloud because you don't want to pay for the storage if you don't want to pay for the records that you're processing within data cloud right now i will move into the data types and primary keys those are pretty straightforward so obviously you need to have, understand what should be your primary key you need to have a unique identifier if not if you don't have one use formula fields to generate that because it's something primary key is something that's enforced at a data stream level in data cloud so when you're bringing in the data in the data at the data stream level this is something that is enforced and you have to use formula fields if you don't already have a unique identifier and then of course in terms of data types you need to understand what kind of data types are supported and ensure that you have a data type alignment between the source systems and data cloud now before you map your data there is one thing you should be very you should be very clear about what is harmonization so harmonization is a process of mapping the ingested data in alignment with the customer 360 data model now the benefit for marketeers or anyone who is using data cloud is that they can work with the harmonized data abstracted from raw source data schemas and this means that they have a very common understanding of the data regardless of the source of origin and they can actually focus on something that they should be focusing on which is drawing insights from the data for marketing or non-marketing business purposes. Now, um, one thing you should be aware of is that data cloud data model is normalized. It's not a denormalized model. So you actually get the denormalized data as you can see here. You act, And this is something I was discussing a few minutes ago as well, kind of normalizing the data, splitting the data, you know, based on your needs. So you need to understand uh, and you need to, you know, kind of recognize how do you normalize your data uh, before you map it into a data cloud. So then once you have assessed that, 
and you understand how do you transform and map your source data to the standard data model. Like I have, I just gave an example around splitting your profile data and engagement data. Um, then you need to understand what kind of subject area, so what kind of data model you actually are going to use. Now, when I say subject area, in our um, data cloud data model or DMOs, standard DMOs, they are actually divided by different subject areas. They're identified by those subject areas. Now, party ID, party is one of those subject areas, engagement, case, they're different subject areas. Um, I recommend that you, you know, go through the trailhead links. I have provided that at the end of this, uh, this, this presentation anyway. Um, go through those links, understand very clearly what every, each and every subject area means and what, does, what that includes so that you are able to understand which part of the standard DMO or standard data model you can use to map your source data. Because a lot of times, I think, uh, I mean, the, <clears throat> because our data model, that the DMOs are quite, um, um, these are quite comprehensive. I think you, there is a quite, a quite a good possibility that you should be able to use one of the existing subject areas to map your data. And then once you are do, able to do that, um, something that we have already covered, what you determine the type of data that you are bringing in per source, which is profile or engagement or other. And then finally, again, use that spreadsheet or the data dictionary that I spoke about earlier to map the source and destination objects and fields. So that obviously data, data cloud is going to store your data, uh, you, know, uh, data, you know, data lineage and all that. But then beyond that, you need to have your own reference because uh, reference of a spreadsheet or a data dictionary where you should map that, okay, these are the source fields, these are the source objects, and this is my target object and target field in data cloud. And then that is where you need to discuss within your team, like when you're doing the design discovery or the design sessions before you are actually getting into build, if there is an extension needed to the standard data model, do you need to extend a, some, you know, a, a standard DMO or you need to create a custom DMO or if, or if there's a better solution that's available, right? That discussion should happen before you bring your data in, before you map your data into data cloud. Now, um, and as I already mentioned that you should only map necessary fields as needed. There is no need to you know, map everything that's coming into data cloud. And, and of course, uh, the, the data cloud uh, data model categories is something that is something you, know, you, sh you should be very careful about. Um, apart from individual, Apart from individual, everything else in the in the standard data model or standard DMO, they don't have a type to start with. What happens is that when you are bringing in a data set of data, or like a DSO or data source object and map to a DLO, and you are mapping the DLO to a DMO, um, the DMO or the or the data model object it inherits the category of the first DLO that is mapped to it. Meaning, if you are bringing in a profile type of data or an engagement type of data and mapping it to a specific standard DMO, that standard DMO does not have any category on its of its own. It will inherit the category of the first DLO that is mapped to it. So later on, in case you needed to change that mapping and basically map something else to that DMO, that DMO will only allow the type that was already or the category of the first DLO that was mapped to it. Like it can only be mapped to a profile DMO if it was initially mapped to the profile DLO. The only exception of this is individual, which is always of type profile. You can only map uh, you know, any, any DLO to the individual DMO if that DLO is of type profile. And then one very important aspect about the data model relationships. If your source data contains individual.id, uh, you should leverage the data model relationships by leveraging the individual data ID. And what do, I, what do I mean by that? Like individual DMO is that key DMO and uh, which is used for your identity resolution and unified profile creation. So at the end of the day, whatever you are mapping to the standard DMO, you need to ensure that ultimately your data model mappings should link it back to or relate it back to the individual object or individual DMO. So the individual dot ID in the individual DMO should be mapped, um, you know, uh, to your data model either directly or through a foreign key primary key relationship. And then you need to ensure that the imported customer data identifiers and contact points are mapped to the required fields. Like 
individual ID, party, and contact point objects because now these three mappings are very important because individual, party, and contact point. And when I say contact point, that means contact point email, contact point phone, and all of that. So individual ID, party, and contact point, these are the three set of DMOs which drive your identity resolution, your unified profile creation, and ultimately what you're actually getting out of CDP or data cloud. So it's very important to ensure that when you're importing your customer identifiers and contact points, et cetera, these are correctly mapped to the required fields in the individual object, party object, and contact point objects. So yeah, this is just a, like, like something that you have probably seen 100 times in the past. I'm not gonna spend any time. Basically, we're saying that we're obviously bringing in different type of phone numbers, multiple emails, data from social handle, uh, data from commerce cloud, commerce profiles, and everything is kind of mapped here and creating a unified profile. Uh, and this is basically what identity resolution looks like. I have, I have some more, I want to actually talk about uh, the unified unified uh, profile slightly in, in slightly more detail here, um, you know, where I will, you know, I, I'll try to cover that part where we are talking about a golden record ID. What is a golden record ID? The, the unified ID creation, how does it unify data? And how does it actually look like? What are the best practices around it? Uh, but but before that, um, I think I will take another quick break, like a couple of minutes, and I will let you ask any questions if you have any. Any questions, team? So I hope everyone is clear about the topics to begin. Cool, yep, I'm just responding to a question, so. Yeah, if there is any question, Lakshmi, yeah, let me know. Okay, I don't think there is anything at this point because I can't hear anything. Anything funny or anything, anything you have in the chat? Yeah, Lakshmi is asking one question. Uh, where the actual mapping will be done? When, where the actual mapping will be, wait. Oh. Where the actual mapping will be done. So yes, as I mentioned, right? So once you're bringing in the data, that data is coming through a DSO or data source object, and that is mapped to a DLO. So DLO is a data lake object within data cloud. That is where your source data is mapped to or rather stored in a DLO. The mapping that actually happens with the DLO and the DMO, DMO is a data model objects. That is again, those are of the objects, those are available within data cloud. So that is where the mapping happens, like the data model mapping happens between the DLO and the DMO. The DSOs, the, the source data objects, they are not directly mapped. They're actually, that data is pushed from DSO to a DLO. So DLO to DMO is actual mapping here. Um, the answering the next one, um, how can we use the data cloud for consent management? So I think this is a bigger question, bigger scope. Uh, don't think we can cover it uh, here, but yes, I mean, quick answer I'm trying to provide here. Um, so data cloud has a consent model as well. You know, I was talking about the subject areas. We also have a subject area around consent management. So there is a consent model and L1, there, there are four levels of consent, L1, L2, L3, and L4. So L1 is, it's like like very quickly depicting that, let's say it's like um, Shivajit wants to receive emails, that's L1. Shivajit wants to receive emails in his work email address or home email address, that's L2. Shivajit wants to receive emails uh, in, you know, um, so, you know, so, so, so that's, that's a work or home email address. That's level two. Level three is, let's say you're asking whether you're going to receive email in a particular medium, like, uh, or it's, it could be a specific channel. 
that's actually the channel is level two and level three is your home or work email address. And then level four is what kind of communication you want to like have, like you want to hear about um, the products in the store, you want to he hear about any upcoming promotions that is level four. So basically L1 to L4, there are four different level levels of consent. So we do have a data model subject area within the standard DMOs in CDP data cloud, where actually you can store those consents. Um, so what typically happens, we have seen is that customers are bringing in data like that. Obviously, data cloud is not a consent management system. This can be, again, data cloud can be a consent management uh, system of reference, not the system of record. You need to have a consent management system. You could use Salesforce privacy. You could use a third party system as well, something like maybe a OneTrust. But what will happen is that you bring in that data from those systems into data cloud. You can map it into data cloud using the consent model that's available. And then you can generate your segments, et cetera, you know, using those consent signals once you map it. So that's long story short, this is how it works. And this is, this is how we, um, you know, propose solutions to our customers. Uh, but yeah, we can, we can probably have a separate session on that. Uh, this is what I can cover today. Anything else, Tim? And Lakshmi, did you get your answer on the DSO, DLO, and DMO? Yep, thanks. Okay. okay. All right, so I'll move forward. Uh, just I'll probably take a few more seconds to see if there's anything. Okay, sounds good. So I think I'll move forward now. Um, so I was going to cover uh, the unified the, the unified ID in a little more detail, and uh, how do we create our unified profiles, right? So, so unified profile is something that maintains all source data and lineage. And when I say source data and lineage, I mean it means. Uh, and let's let's actually look at this example, and then we can. We can cover more on this. So if you see, there are four different records here, right? And actually, all of these are um, all of these are pertaining to the same person, Rebecca Williams. But as you can see, there are four different systems: Sales Cloud, some store. You know, there are two, two different stores, and then there is Marketing Cloud. So it's actually coming from four different systems. You are getting this data in, and Based on your match rules, you could match all of these four records, maybe these three records using the first name or maybe the last name. Uh, you could match it based on your email address or, or you could match it using your phone number. But overall, uh, based on multiple match rules, you can actually match all of these four records or unify these four records together. And ultimately what it generates, it generates an unified ID. It's a, it's a new ID, completely different ID than this four that you are seeing today. So this is nothing but that unified individual ID. This is the unified individual ID where you will see this, this particular person, Rebecca Williams is mapped to, but then you will not see a winner here. There is no winner over the email, like which is the best email or which is the best phone number. There is no winner. What it is actually doing, this unified ID, this unified individual ID, this is one record that is unifying the data for Rebecca Williams from all systems. What we, what we learn from this is, Rebecca Williams is one person who has done X, Y, Z in these four different systems. Is This record is generated from these four different systems. Rebecca Williams uses this couple of email addresses, this couple of phone numbers, and she has interest in product A. She has totally spent around 400 plus 200, that is $600. And she has had five clicks and two opens in from Marketing Cloud. So that is the overall information that we have. And you know that is the, that is the role of CDP. That is the role of Data Cloud. Um, and this is this is quite unique and quite different from what an MDM does. What would an MDM do? An MDM would ideally try to match these records and create one golden record, right? It is going to replace, it's going to find a winner. Okay, this is the best email, this is the best phone. And like basically one single record. That is the purpose of MDM. But the purpose of data cloud is different. Purpose of data cloud is unifying 
your customer data from multiple systems and stitching them together so that you know your customer better. Your customers know their customers better because you are bringing these customers from four, five, six, seven different systems. At the end of the day, if you are able to identify, okay, this is the same person funny who is making purchases in these different systems, who is actually doing this, this, this activity in these different systems. And this is, and, and basically you are going to get that customer 360 view or unified view of this particular person or that particular person could be funny, that particular person could be someone else, but you can get the unified view of what this person is doing across different systems. And accordingly, you can take a decision, you cannot create a journey, you can actually create different, you know, Different, different activations and you can actually create different decisions. You can generate insights out of the data and you can actually better target these customers because you now know them better. You know them from different systems. You did not have any idea this, that this person actually spends so much amount of money in these kind of stores. Now that you know this information about them, you can actually use it to your, to, to good effect, to actually better for customer personalization. So that is where the unified profile comes into picture. And it's very important to me to understand is that unified ID, it's not meant to be used as a golden record ID. We know that there are customers who sometimes are thinking about using this as a golden record ID, but we should understand that this unified record ID or this unified ID is subject to change. It's an immutable, it's not immutable. So, which means this kind of a data is, is subject to change. And when does it change? If there is a change in the source systems, if there's a better match rule criteria, you have changed your match rules and reconciliation rules, it reruns the algorithm again, it could actually generate a new unified individual ID and that would change. So the, so the, so the way uh, uh, you should be using this data is basically knowing more about the customer in a, and stitching the data and link the data from, about your customers from different systems and ultimately, you can use this unified ID and use the, there is something called an unified link individual. That unified link, unified link individual ID can be used in calculated insights and also can be used in other uh, data explorers as, as well to find the lineage about the data. Because at the end of the day, as I mentioned, right, all data points associated with individual and complete lineage, it, lineage is retained within data cloud. Meaning if your data is coming from four different sources, you will have information about what is the what are the different sources this data is coming from. That's called the data lineage. And you will have that information through the unified link individual. So that's your unified profile. So now once you, once you are creating the unified profiles, there are some of the things that you should keep in mind, right? As best practices. First of all, using the data dictionary that you already created, evaluate the strategy of how do you want to identify, like how do you want to match your data? How do you, what, what kind of identity resolution rules you want to create? What is your unification strategy? Um, and then uh, be very intentional of what kind of match rules you want to use, right? Uh, because I have seen that customers probably would start with a contact point phone or contact point email as a match rule. It's very easy to do that, but then that's not a recommended practice. And the reason is that you know, I didn't understand, first of all, the impact of a shared email or a shared phone for unification. What is your business goal? What would happen, right, if you inappropriately unify or match multiple individuals? So it could happen, right, in a particular household, the husband and wife, probably they are using the same email address, right? In such a scenario, if you are actually using a, using, using a match rules based on the contact point email, what will happen that you are actually going to incorrectly, you know, incorrectly map uh, the husband and your wife to different profiles into one single profile. So, and it, this could be your business logic as well. Maybe you have a household business logic. Like you want to unify based on households, but that may not be as business logic as well, right? So you need to understand what is your business goal. You need to understand what is your best and worst case scenario. Do you want a match criteria which is more restrictive or more permissive? Because um, if you inappropriately unified individuals, that could actually impact major areas of your business. So maybe you want more 
part, uh, more restrictive match criteria so that you don't do that. So in such a case, you need to create or you need to configure your match rules in such a manner that they are more restrictive. Less consolidation is okay, but you are ensuring that you are not inappropriately mapping or matching unified multiple individuals. So once that is done, you can use your multiple identity, you can use multiple identity graphs, which is nothing but A-B testing. You have that facility. You can actually run A-B testing to see, um, to, to run multiple, uh, you know, uh, identity resolution rule sets to compare um, and the consolidation rate and also what kind of matching criteria is, is bringing out what kind of results. And based on that, you can finalize on, on, your, on, your, on your, you know, match rule and reconciliation rule configurations. Uh, one important tip I wanted to share is that uh, party identification is a very important object to match using external and third party identifiers. Uh, why I mentioned that is because um, when you're bringing in data from multiple third party identifiers, third party source systems, right? Maybe a license, maybe a loyalty, maybe a loyalty management system, uh, which is a third party system, or it could be some other systems and also something in the ecosystem, maybe marketing cloud CRM as well. Um, and, and as well as maybe mobile SDK and web SDK, right? So you, you could probably bring in, you know, party IDs from multiple systems. Now, uh, the, the best way to match using external and third party identifiers is basically using the party identification object. So this party identification is not the party ID. I'm talking about the party identification DMO that's there as one of the standard DMOs in data cloud. So there are three columns, three fields there, which you can use the party ID itself, the party identifier, the party ID, and the party ID type or the party identifier type. So you can use those three fields or combination of those three fields to identify and match, um, you know, the the customer identifiers that's coming from multiple third party systems. Now, um, now that we have covered the the unification of the data, how do we match the data? How do we create your profiles and all that? Um, we will now move into the segmentation part of it, right? Now, segmentation and activation are two distinct steps. And this is something obviously people who are using CDP for a long time or some time would know. But for new users, uh, creation of a segment does not mean uh, publish of that segment to your activation mediums. So, and, and some of the things that you are doing during segmentation does not apply to activation. You have to actually, you know, apply certain rules during the activation itself. I mean, when you are going through the activation engine, uh, the activation setup, you will go through those things like, what is your, what is the email address you want to pick? And, and maybe there are other criteria as well you want to select during the activation. So um, when it comes to segment, right? It's something that we always recommend that if possible, use the individual DMO, like the unified individual DMO to create your segments. And the reason is this, in case you are not able to use an unified individual DMO, you can still create a segment. You can still activate that segment and publish, publish obviously, and activate the segment. The thing that you're missing out on is this, that when you're activating that segment, you are actually going to activate um, the same profiles multiple times in your activation channel. Like, let's say uh, it's me. I'm talking about my individual ID, my profile. So it's Shivajit. And I have had 15 visits in a particular store. And a segment is created in such a way, uh, which kind of picks up six of those visits. So when this is actually activating back into the activation channel, it could be marketing cloud, let's say, it's actually going to activate my profile six times because of those six visits. And, and the other thing is that when you're using unified individual, you can actually ensure that you are able to uniquely pick up the profiles and there is no duplication of profiles while you are activating to our activation mediums or activation targets. Some of the some of the commonly known activation targets are marketing cloud. Uh, you have S3 and GCS. Uh, you have curated DMO. You have App Exchange partners as well. We also have activation targets very recently, which were introduced, which are you know advertising activation targets like your uh, you know your Meta and Meta as well as Google. So Facebook, Facebook business manager, as well as Google. So those are also there. Uh, and also you can activate back into commerce cloud. You can activate back into personal marketing cloud personalization. So you also have a uh, mule soft any point connect through which you can activate back into a lot of other systems as well. 
Um, one of the thing is that regarding segments, however, um, we are saying that we obviously have a 12 hour or a 24 hour schedule for segments. Um, this is just to let you know that we have a pilot that's ongoing right now. It's not a, it's not a live uh, feature yet. We have something called a rapid segment that's being piloted right now. Um, obviously, uh, there are certain restrictions that, that we are put in because it's a rapid segment. A rapid segment can do a segment publish or a segment refresh with a one hour schedule as opposed to 12 or 24 hours. And this is to support more near real time use cases where one can actually refresh this, the segment in every one hour. That's called a rapid segment. Uh, the restriction is that you can only use a look back of data up to seven days. And this is only applicable to marketing cloud today. For any marketing cloud activations, you can use the look back of up to seven days and you can create a rapid segment with a one hour publish schedule. However, this is currently in pilot. It is not a live feature yet. Uh, customers who have enrolled to the pilot uh, are, are, are using this feature right now. And uh, based on the feedback, based on the outcome of the pilot phase, uh, we, will, we will let you know more about the, plan, the future plans on when this is going to become live. Now, finally, I'm going to talk about, so obviously we've been uh, talking about uh, some batch use cases, 12 hour and 24 hour schedules, and what are the options to uh, have more near real time use cases. And then this is where we are talking about data actions. So data action is something that is where uh, we can have more real time use cases where you can actually stream data with, let's say, I mean, and it creates streaming insights that can actually ag aggregate data every five minutes up to 24 hours. Let's say you are visiting a petrol pump and you are making a purchase. If we have a streaming insight and streaming data inside, I mean, streaming data activated there, the data streams into CDP and in data cloud. It creates insights with, let's say, five minutes of look back window or maybe 10 minutes of window. And uh, in the last 10 minutes of window, if there is a purchase done, in a petrol pump by a particular profile, uh, that's a known profile. In that case, uh, you know you can actually create a streaming insight out of it, and that can be used for sending a near real time, like within five minutes, it's going to send an email, it can send a chatter post, it can send a Slack message to the customer, and what I mean by that, you can send an offer uh, through an email or a Slack message, or it can actually create a case in Service Cloud. Uh, by by logging a platform event, so do all those type of all those sort of things. So you can actually bring in data from a mobile SDK, web SDK, marketing cloud personalization, or you can stream data from multiple third party systems as well. And this is where you can actually use data actions and the and the power of Salesforce platform to 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 invoke platform events or you know or to to invoke uh, different type of events in the salesforce platform itself in a real time capacity and this also works as i mentioned beyond market uh, beyond the platform which is like on marketing cloud as well as outside uh, through a slack message or or even a webhook it can it can invoke a webhook as well um so some of the best practices again that we should i'm um, like or i would say considerations that we should keep in mind for segmentation and activation are these. Um, you need to understand and categorize where do you need a, you know, where you are fine to have a batch use case versus you need a real-time use case. A lot of times we have seen the customer use cases are, 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 are good to go with a batch use case where they can wait for a few hours. There you can actually use the segmentation activation, uh, the, the, those, those you know, features of data cloud to actually create more batch actions. And when you need a real-time uh, real action or if, if it's really a completely real-time use case, you can leverage data actions on objects or streaming insights. Um, the other thing that I mentioned was obviously understanding that segmentation and activations are two different activities in Marketing Cloud. These are not the same thing. Segment requires a public schedule and an activation to be sent to an activation target. And a single single segment can actually activate to multiple activation targets. Like it can it can be connected. A one segment can be connected to let's say ten different activation targets, and you can 
uh, publish that segment and it can actually activate back into all those 10 activation targets together. This doesn't have to be, this doesn't have to be together. These are very separately configured. The activation targets is a separate configuration. Segment is a separate configuration. One of the things that you should keep in mind is a couple of things I would say in order to test segments, because I have seen these questions from coming from a few customers where they wanted to test their segments, the segment memberships a little better, right? One of the ways is, of course, you can activate the segment back into the same data cloud instance, and that's called a curated demo. You can look into the curated demo through Data Explorer. You can analyze the data. You can do stuff with the data. And you can actually you know, understand what kind of data that's there, what is the membership, what is there. But then what if you want to understand historical membership? So there is something called a segment membership DMO as well. You can use a segment membership DMO, look it up in the help and resources uh, that's already available for this. This was a feature that came out last year. Um, so this segment membership DMO can be used to analyze the data and preview some of the current and historical segment membership. Like if something was a part of a segment like today, or if it's if it, if something was a part of a segment, maybe last year, maybe six months before today. So that kind of information you can get from the segment membership demo, and that will be able to help enhance your testing strategy on overall segmentation data. And then uh, you, you should be aware of the system limits for segmentation, that it's restricted to a two year look back uh, for data that's that's coming in with a type of event or engagement. And then if you need any insights or need to do something with data that greater, that's greater than two years, we recommend you to use calculated insights to aggregate the historical events and, for, and, and basically generate insights and measurements out of the data that's beyond two year look back. And then finally, um, this highlights some of the key items to keep in mind before kicking off an implementation. And this is not, this is kind of less to do with the product, more to do with some of the some of the processes, some of the governance mechanisms. Like first of all, use case feasibility, right? This is very important. Use use case fitment before we get into the build phase, even get into the discovery. I would say like even we get into the design phase, it's very important to understand the use case fitment. What can and cannot be done in data cloud. I actually recently was working with a customer um, who was trying to kind of build their loyalty management system in data cloud. Obviously, that's not something data cloud that data cloud is built for or known for. You can build your loyalty management system using loyalty management. That's a productized solution that is for softwares. Uh, and of course, data cloud can complement that by obviously, you know, uh, generating segments, creating more real-time use cases, and driving some of the use cases uh, for the for the loyalty customers. But it is it plays a secondary role there, right? It's not something that's going to deliver the loyalty solution. So it's very important and very clear. Uh, the customer should be very clear on what can and cannot be done. And also, I was just talking about consent management a few minutes ago, right? Data Cloud is not a consent management platform right it can manage the it can manage the consent data you can map the consent data within the consent data model and based on that you can take certain actions so it's very you have to be very clear on what can and cannot be done in data cloud what should be our goal of data cloud in a particular use case and then then think about the next steps right don't solve for use cases the product doesn't support yet and and let's not think about the product even. Think about the complete platform, the ecosystem that Salesforce offers. So there are other tools, other solutions, or maybe multiple solutions that will give you the same outcome that you want to achieve. So in order to understand that, you need to get into those rather than thinking about what, I mean, rather than just incorrectly mapping a requirement that Data Cloud cannot deliver on its own. Now that's obviously the product and the platform. Right? Now beyond that, this is a, again something that's very important. That's the organizational internal alignment. Now data cloud is something that will affect several departments in an organization. And I know that you they all need to have a buy-in to the project, to the implementation, but still at the end of the day, uh, you need to break out of the organizational silos and you still need a single group to own and drive the success of data cloud the implementation of the data cloud and more than the data cloud and the implementation, the use case, the business use case that you're trying to achieve. So that is something that should be aligned very clearly with a single group in the organization because a lot of times that does not happen. And what happens at the end of the day, 
you are not able to get like the customer is unable to get complete value of their existing investments and that's exactly what we want we want customers to get uh, you know get get the get the complete value the the realize the total value out of their existing investments with salesforce or any other product for that matter and then moving on to the metal methodology as i was just discussing like don't just jump into build without having a proper preparation preparation phase as well as a discovery or design um it's very important to discover your use cases define the right use cases and prioritize what use cases you are going to deliver in phase 1 phase 2 and phase 3 and so on you need to have a foundational approach towards data cloud implementation starting from a crawl walk run phase because uh, those foundational use cases is something the customer should be uh, aware of and that is something they will get them that will actually get them excited about the implementation early in the game because uh, if you are not able to prioritize your use cases and if you are kind of having an ongoing implementation for months and months and there is no value realization it's very easy to lose focus on the project so it's very important to define the project and then prioritize the use cases that is going to be delivered in the initial phase and then finally um, it's very important to audit the source data prepare your data model design like the data dictionary i have been covering in this in this entire presentation that understand what are your use cases just don't bring in everything because you can like of course you can bring in a lot of data sources into data cloud but understand what kind of use cases you need what kind of data sources you need and then only bring in those data sources that will actually add value that will help you help you realize value that will help you deliver your use case because there is no instant undo button within data cloud like if you are bringing in a data set of data of course you can delete those data streams but uh, you know if you want to refactor data remediate some of the data that sometimes can take time and effort sometimes that cannot that that may not be very easy to do and there could be some multiple steps you need to do and retesting and all that so it's very important that you understand audit your source data and prepare a proper solid design before you bring that data into data cloud and map to the data model now this is something i'll obviously share afterwards um, i will share this uh, this deck these details with funny and he will share with the entire group uh, this is a recommended success path for new data cloud users and in fact data cloud users who are also probably in the middle of middle of their journey they can also use this to ensure that they're using these resources at the right time and they build a strong foundation right uh, towards their data cloud data cloud knowledge and then finally uh, as i was mentioning earlier i have provided some of the relevant trailhead links community links uh, and some uh, you know downloadable pdf guides which are very very relevant for customers to set up administer and configure data cloud uh, and then of course uh, some of the other things those are available for customers and partners uh, when it comes to an ask an expert office hours could be expert coaching sessions those are available for customers your customers and you can recommend those to the customers uh, to 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 take advantage of those as well so yeah all of that is available and that's that's pretty much what we have wanted to cover today So um, I think I'm done actually at this point. So I don't know who is the coordinator of this. So I'll feel free to unmute yourself and let me know if there is any any other question that we need to take at this point. Yes, Shubhajit. Well, it is wait for two minutes. Uh, any questions from any team? Pani has answered some sort of questions here. Okay, hi, Subhajit. Uh, so thank you so much for the session. So there are a few questions, Subhajit, yeah. uh, especially from Lakshmi and Ramesh. Uh, so I answered my view, so probably you could answer your views as well. So the question is, so when do we create the golden record? After unified profile records or which stage? So as I said, we don't generate a golden record in Data Cloud. We generate a unified profile ID. That's basically the, the unified individual ID. And that is something, and if you say that's a golden record, yes, that's a golden record. So we, um, you know, so once the match rules and reconciliation rules are run, you are able to decide uh, or kind of match your data using party ID and some of the other custom fields maybe uh, at an individual DMO level. And then you can obviously, you know, create, uh, you know, you can create some reconciliation rules to decide 
what is your winner, what is your best email address, what is your best phone number, etc. Then you have your unified record created or unified profile created. We don't call it a golden record, um, you know, quote unquote golden record. It's a unified profile record. But yes, that's that's pretty much what it is. Yeah, so it's like unified profile ID. Uh, yeah, we can call it as our terms. So, so you I have think, a uh, unified profile yeah. ID. And uh, it's called a unified yeah. individual ID, of course. And then you have something Correct. called a unified link individual. You can use that uh, to actually link it back to the lineage to understand what are the different sources. But at the end of the day, the way it looks like you have a unified ID, unified individual ID, and you have the phone numbers, email addresses, the engagements across different channels. That's basically one single record that gives you the stitched. In, I mean, it, that basically helps you stitch all the information for your customers together from all systems. All right, thank you. Uh, so there is another way, right? So which is in terms of, uh, let's take an example. So there some of the customers where they don't want to touch their individual profile ID, and then they would love to create a new field under the individual table, nothing but individual mm -hmm. DMO object, and then mm -hmm. they'll perform some concatenation. Let's take an example. From B2C Commerce Cloud, you'll get some ID. From Sales Cloud, you get an ID. So what they perform is they'll do concatenation using that field, and then they'll use that cardinality between one-on-one -on -one mapping at a DMO level, and then they'll perform all these tools and design individual record as well. Yeah, that, that you can do using a formula field always. So that's always mm -hmm. available, yeah. Yeah, so yeah, so so that's one question. The other question is, uh, is this unified ID auto-generated or do we give any instruct a specific format as such from like No, no, it's auto-generated. or it's auto -generated. You don't have any control uh, to uh, to define how your unified individual ID will look like. And that is precisely why, as I said, it's immutable. It's not immu like it, it is subject to change, right? Yeah. So if you change your match rules, if you change your reconciliation rules, if you change some of the source priorities, if you add new sources, so there are different criteria like this through which once you rerun that unified profile, like that identity resolution process, after changing all of this, there is a possibility that it will end up generating a new ID. So that's how it works. Yeah, so so that's all we have subject. Uh, thank you so much for, for, for giving all the session knowledge and knowledge. It's very really quite informative and really thank you for your contribution. And really thank you for joining with us today yeah. as well. So thank yeah. you once again. I think we'll have a tomorrow session, great session again with the licensing package strategy. So yeah. we all will catch up tomorrow as well at the same time. Thank you. All right. Thank you. So tomorrow we will talk about the pricing and I think the packaging strategy of the of data cloud with with marketing and data cloud with Tableau. So yep. that's primarily what we'll cover tomorrow. All right. Thank cool. you. Thank you so much. Have a nice day. Bye.